This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. With the excitement of new images coming from the James Webb Space Telescope pointing everyone's eyes to the skies, a flashing star some 3,000 light years away has captured the attention of a team of curious astronomers who believe they may have discovered a neutron star that is consuming a companion star. This type of event is known as a black widow binary when two stars are bound to one another by gravity, and the neutron star, created by the supernova of a Gia star, has a super dense collapsed core, and is feeding on its partner like a black widow spider. We spoke with Joseph E. Pesch, an astrophysicist with 30 years of experience and a program director at the NSF, director for Mathematical and Physical Sciences, Division of Astronomical Science. Dr. Pesch, can you tell us what a binary star system is? Stars form out of collapsing gas clouds, they turn on and they start fusing and shine and produce heat and light and energy, uh, just like our sun. Our sun is uh, isolated in space. It has no stellar companion that's, that's gravitationally bound to it. Lots of planets, of course, but there's not a stellar companion. And on the contrary, most stars are formed with another companion, if there's another one, so there's two stars, we call that a binary star system, where they are locked gravitationally and they orbit each other. And so that's the more common way that stars are formed in the universe. So in a binary star system, usually the stars have the same mass. Mass is important for the subsequent life cycle of a star. The more massive a star is, the faster they consume their, their fuel and their lifetimes. And while we have you, can you tell us why the Black Widow variation is rare? It's rare because, you know, binary stars can be in multiple configurations. They can be very close, they can be further apart. And the further they are apart, uh, the wind is still coming off of the evolved companion, the neutron star in, in this case. But it's far enough away that it's not damaging the nearby companion. If they're too close, then that wind can ablate, can remove the outer atmosphere of the companion star. Supported in part by NSF, researchers at MIT were studying the luminescence of stars, looking to add to the dozen known widow binaries when they found this neutron star with a companion orbiting every 62 minutes. A binary system of this type alone is a rare find but they were even more amazed to see what appears to be a third distant object orbiting the pair every 10,000 years. This wide orbit companion is a rare low metallicity, cool subdwarf star, and would make this system the first of its kind ever observed. To hear more about this discovery, we spoke with Dr. Kevin Burge, one of the researchers at MIT who found this unique system. Dr. Burge, how did you see these stars? Well, we have visible light curves, so these basically measurements of how bright something is versus time for over a billion stars now, thanks to the Zwicky Transient Facility. Uh, ZTF was largely funded through the National Science Foundation. That's its biggest funder. And so now, basically, for every part of the sky in the Northern Hemisphere, we've got thousands of images on this 48-inch telescope. And what I do is I basically look at each of those stars in those images and say, what is the star? are doing over these thousand images. And I specifically look for stars that are getting brighter and fainter and brighter again and fainter and repeating that on a particular schedule. Um, and it just so happens that these Black Widow systems are some of the most extreme things that get brighter and fainter. Very few things get brighter by factors of more than 10. And so this is really the first time that someone has used only visible light to try to find a neutron star of any kind, to my knowledge. There's the strong possibility that this could even be something like completely different than anything we've seen before. And we interpret it as a Black Widow because it behaves most similarly to those of the things we know. But something that uh, I'm trying to keep an open mind until we see the pulsar, I'm also still considering whether there are other interpretations to explain what we're seeing here. Uh, whatever it is, what is clear is we've never seen something quite like this object before. What does your research on this binary star system teach us? So this is a triple system, actually. Uh, there's like an inner binary with an hour orbital period that we think is a black widow. 
there's an outer companion in a 10,000 year orbit going around those. That's actually kind of unexpected. And the reason is, is when you form a neutron star from a star, what happens is it's called a core collapse supernova. Basically, the star collapses in on itself to form the neutron star core. But during that very violent event, there's also an explosion. Um, that explosion is usually not symmetric. It doesn't eject the matter out in exactly uh, isotropic distribution in the sphere. Usually more gets ejected towards one side. If you eject too much matter towards one side, what happens is you basically kick the core in the opposite direction to conserve momentum. Um, these are called neutron star natal kicks. So we think most neutron stars are probably born with these kicks. And we see evidence that they move with pretty high velocities uh, to corroborate that. The problem is, is if you have a wide triple with a companion in a 10,000 year orbit, you can't really kick the neutron star very much or it would just go flying off in one direction and leave behind this wide companion because it's not very strongly gravitationally bound. Um, and so one thing this system is letting us probe is if it is indeed a black widow, it's testing neutron star kick physics. Um, because it means either the system must have formed a neutron star before it became a triple, or if it was already a wide triple when you formed the neutron star, it had to form out of a really low kick mechanism, some really symmetric way of collapsing and making the neutron star. So that's like a very specific bit of physics that we can study from the system. But I think the bigger picture fun thing is that we've got hundreds of billions of sources of light, and each one of them is a little experiment that lets us test these little details details in our models. The National Science Foundation has largely been responsible for driving a lot of these instruments that are making this possible. And the bigger thing on the horizon is the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is also a huge National Science Foundation effort. That's going to be the centerpiece of my research for the next five to ten years. How far away is this binary? Yeah, so it's about one kiloparsec, which is about 3,000 light years. Um, to give reference, the distance to the center of the galaxy from Earth is about eight kiloparsecs. So one kiloparsec is kind of in our local part of the galaxy. It's getting kind of far away, but still close enough that we can see it. And that's the key. These things are really faint because the irradiated objects are brown dwarfs. So if you put them too far away, you just can't see them with something like ZTF on a one meter telescope. And knowing that we're measuring distance by light moving over time, can you tell us how long ago what you've observed occurred? Yeah, so about 3,000 years ago. Um, we're seeing it uh, delay because the light travel time is so long uh, from the system. Finally, do you have any advice for young people interested in astrophysics? This is a great time to get into the field. It's really being revolutionized because of advances, not just in our abilities to build bigger telescopes. Um, that's been something that's been happening for the last 50 years. The big game changer has been electronics. Digital cameras have been a huge invention. And the thing is, is they keep getting better. And the other thing that's improving is our ability to analyze that data. So something I spend a lot of time doing is writing algorithms on computers that takes all those images and actually finds something interesting, the needle in the haystack. And so I would say uh, it's a great time to get into this because there's so much potential coming in the next 10 to 20 years because of our advances in digital technology, both like computing technology like GPUs, but also digital cameras. All we need to do is basically have that keep advancing and keep installing it on telescopes and use it to analyze the data. Special thanks to Dr. Kevin Burge, Dr. Joseph Pesch, Terrence Affer Henderson, Adam Eggers, and Dina Headley. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts, and if you like our program, consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.